Welcome back, everyone. A multidisciplinary discussion among the academic researchers, doctors, and technology professionals to investigate ethical challenges of using virtual environments and devices in various medical uses, along with potential solutions. Is what we are saying today for our closing panel confronting ethical challenges in the immersive healthcare. Together with us on this panel, we have Susan Persky, Associate Investigator, National Human Genome Research Institute. Susan Persky directs the Immersive Simulation Program within the Social and Behavioral Research Branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute, National Institute of Health. She earned a PhD in Social Psychology from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she studied at the Research Center of Virtual environment for virtual environments and behavior. Dr. Persky's programmatic, programmatic, programmatic sorry, research focuses on the application of genomic or common complex health conditions in healthcare and community context. She additionally investigates and develops best practices for VR design, evaluation, and implementation in health, medical, and scientific context. Next, we have on the panel. Anne Lord Bailey, Dr. Anne Lord Bailey, is a board certified pharma pharmacotherapist, specialist, director of clinical tech innovation and immersive technology lead for BHA, Office of the Healthcare Innovation Learning, OHIL. Dr. Bailey started her healthcare journey as a pharmacy resident and then pharmacy practitioner for Western North Carolina, VA Healthcare Systems in Asheville, North Carolina. In 2020, she joined OHIL team for the implementation of emerging technology with a particular focus on immersive tech. She has collaborated with experts and thought leaders in government, academia, and while collating the expansion of the VHA XR network from the founding five facilities to over 160, engaging more than 1,250 VA employees. Recently, Dr. Bailey was awarded as the 2022 G2 Exchange Change Agent Award, along with her OHIL Impact team members, the 2022 service to the citizens of She also received an International Virtual Reality in Healthcare Association's 2022 role. And next on the panel, we have Nadir. Nadir Bebel, Dr. Nadir Rebel is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at UC San Diego and the associate faculty director at the USD Design Lab. Dr. Rebel is also a research health science specialist at the VA San Diego Health System. He is affiliated with the National Robotic Institute, Center of Population and Health System, and the Research Center on Optimal Digital Ethics. His work on human centered extended situated at the intersection of computer science, design, and the health sciences. Current work focuses on human-computer interaction, artificial intelligence, and extended reality investigation tools, techniques, and infrastructure for the de deployment of innovative, interactive, multimodal, and tangible devices in context, studying, and quantifying the cognitive consequences of the introduction of this technology in everyday life. And last but not least, moderator, Dr. Charles Blinky is an experienced heptobiliary and, sorry, I hope I said that correctly, um, and pancreas surgeon, bioethicist, and healthcare quality. Dr. Blinky attended Georgetown Surgery training at the University of Michigan, where he was awarded as the NIH Fellowship in Gastrointestinal Surgery and Pancreatic Cancer Research. Dr. Blinky is the Director of Bioethics at the Hackensack Meridian Health and Associate Professor of Surgery at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. Before his current position, Dr. Blinky practiced at the Bioliary. To definitely correct me on that, Dr. Okay. So it's and pancreas surgery. It's hepatoclary. You can just say liver and pancreas. Liver and pancreas. Thank you so much. 
at the Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in San Francisco, California, where he was also chair of the Bioethics Committee, president of the medical staff, and the chief inpatient quality, chief of inpatient quality. Dr. Blakey was also director of bioethics at Santa Clara University's Arcula Center of Applied Ethics in Silicon Valley, where he still holds the honorary title of bioethics fellow. His academic research is focused on ethical issues impacting surgeons and surgical care, and artificial intelligence, clinical patients, shared medicine, assigning more responsible AI guided. Wow, what a fantastic panel we have today. Without further ado, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Please take it away. And Susan, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And it's such a delight and privilege to be here tonight and with such an august uh, group of panelists. So I appreciate the invitation. So I want to sort of talk about a couple of things before we that we want to consider when we introduce anything into the to the physician or the clinician patient relationship. There are certain ethical obligations that govern that relationship that are different than applications of XR in other areas. The second is that you know, as a clinician, I really come about this or come to this from a patient and family centric perspective. And that's where I think about the ethical implications of XR uh, in in therapeutic relationships and in treatment environments. And I think about it from a, a patient and family centric, but also considerations that may apply to the clinician. So I wanna, I wanna take a very applied approach and talk about some of the specific applications that I know my, my panelists and the members of the panel here are involved in, and then think with them through some of the ethical implications that, that are raised. The first, uh, the first application that I want to, to introduce and talk about uh, is is one that uh, I know uh, and has been involved in, and that is the, uh, the use of XR to potentially reduce uh, opioid use in the perioperative period. Uh, Anne, do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, th it's one of the areas that actually began a lot of the cl clinical implementation of virtual reality across the VA was a program that was begun by Caitlin Rollins in Asheville, North Carolina, the VA um, there, looking at ways to identifying a problem, which was increased opioid use, um, particularly postoperatively, and also addressing um, extended length of stay following knee replacement. And uh, Caitlin saw an opportunity to, to think differently about how we deliver care and how veterans experience care and, and um, saw an opportunity there with positive distraction and virtual reality. Um, and we have seen incredible success uh, that began with that particular pilot 2017, um, but by far pain management, um, including perioperative pain management is the most common use case across VA right now. That, that's really a very fascinating uh, application, particularly when we think about all the other adjuncts that are being used to uh, decrease or minimize uh, opioid use um, in all sorts of different settings. One of the most pertinent being the perioperative setting. So the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, do you think of this as a, as a therapy or as a research trial? This is a great conversation that I love um, going back and forth with Dr. Persky about. She and I get have the privilege of, of being government interagency colleagues. Um, and so working together from both a research and clinical implementation perspective, I think what we know about VR um, and we're seeing and experiencing that's really exciting is that um, compared to some of the other things that we um, have used in care in the past, uh, we know that it is, is relatively safe and we want to find ways to offer opportunities for, in our case, veterans, but patients in general um, to experience um, what virtual reality is in a safe space and under clinical evaluation and, and being recommended by providers that are using their good clinical judgment um, to evaluate do, pa do patients like it will they use it is there um, impact on, on actual measurable outcomes and that's the does it work piece right um, and then also 
how are clinicians able to utilize it and implement it in their um, in their clinical workflow and in their care um, pathways? But I would love if I'm able to to invite Dr. Persky to respond to that as well. Sure, happy to. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I tried to kick as many kids off the Wi-Fi as I could. Um, <laughs> so. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's something we think about a lot. I mean, I think as, um, you know, as Anne's saying, it, you know, it does come down to risk benefit, you know, in, in some in some sense. I mean, I think, you know, when research is not happening, it's it's not, you know, research per se, but I, I do think it is a, a great opportunity for research and one that is probably, you know, not um, as well as well um, capitalized on as, as we could. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, great potential for research um, to be integrated here. But I think, you know, for some indications, we do have enough information showing that there is probably, you know, enough benefit to suggest some of those, these things. Um, because really, a lot of times they can't hurt. Um, and we're, we're, I don't think in most areas of healthcare, we're not really in a place where we're sort of substituting these tools for something else um, that has shown, you know, true benefit. Um, so early days, but I would say can you hear me? No, I, I just lost you. Oh, I, yeah, I got muted. Um, I, I must have made somebody unhappy. Um, so I mean, I think I think you know early days, but still, you know, there is both research activity and clinical activity, and I think there's there's space for both of those things. Well, that's really great. Thank you both. And where where uh, where my where mind goes as you're talking about this, I want to pick up on one of the things that you said, Anna. That's you know the clinical judgment, and we know that clinical judgment can be notoriously biased. So how do we know that this application is being offered equitably across your patient population? I think that's a great question. I think one of the things is exactly what you're doing and what we're doing here and, and saying is having that conversation, right? We we prioritize across VA um, programs that are focused on evaluating and also implementing um, the inclusion, diversity, equity, access. Like those are all things that we're thinking about as we're delivering care in general. That's no different in how we approach VR. Um, one of the things that we we want to make sure that we're thinking about and looking to as well is we don't want to create new areas of inequity or um, barriers to access or things like that. So these this is all part of the learning process for um, for thinking about new modalities of care and ways that we can transform, again, in our case, veterans and um, their care experience and how we deliver care to them. Um, and being mindful of that, keeping that diversity, equity, um, inclusion, language in conversation as we think about um, rolling out clinical innovation in general, but specifically for this conversation, virtual reality, I think is really important. Um, so I think keeping the conversation going is, is how we continue to do that. Right. Thank you. I, I guess the other thing uh, that that comes to mind, you know, clinically for me is, is you know, is there the potential that these therapies could um, could wind up stigmatizing patients inadvertently? So, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking about you know specifically opioid use and patients who sometimes need additional opioids for whatever reason uh, are termed drug seeking, or they can sometimes be profiled incorrectly. Is, are there safeguards in place to make sure that patients who may need additional opioids, despite the use of this adjunct, aren't incorrectly profiled? Yeah, I'm not sure if that question is for me, but I can certainly speak for how VA uh, manages that. This is, again, another modality. Um, pharmacotherapy is not our only modality for, for pain management or pain care. So we think about the variety of modalities in the same way, and we want to make sure that we're thinking um, about what we're prescribing and recommending and how we are addressing, um, in this case, again, you know, pain management in a way that meets the patient where they are and provides the patient what they need. Um, and being mindful of time, you know, of that opportunity to sort of stigmatize people, um, something that the VA works work is working on and focusing on in general, and and that's not specific to VR. It's just how we think about delivering care. Right. 
Yeah, that's really excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you on both accounts for, for thinking so thoughtfully about how to, um, to distribute this, which is very promising. Uh, equitably, and then also how to avoid inferred bias. You know, as a bioethicist, I always think about how to um, how to think about inadvertent harms. You know, sometimes even our best uh, our best intentions wind up harming inadvertently. And so, I really do appreciate the care that you provide uh, specifically to the patients and the VA system. Uh, I next want to turn to Nadir and talk a little bit about uh, a specific application that he's using uh, XR for. And that is something that's, of course, close to me in my career, and that's in surgery. Yeah, so surgery um, is uh, one of the typical um, kind of application when you think about uh, XR uh, that has to do with, um, you know, giving additional support to, to users in general. Um, you know, we, we are working on uh, basically a on research and we are hopefully hope, hope, hoping to shift it to actual practice as well <clears throat> where we are trying to help uh, surgeons that might not be able to perform a particular procedure uh, and supplement them with uh, you know remote uh, help using uh, using XR uh, the work you've been doing is really about uh, you know bringing this expertise where it's not where it does not exist and uh, ultimately helping, you know, basically broadening the, the possibility that specific uh, procedures can be, can be applied in emergency setting, in remote locations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so this is um, something that has been around as an idea for many, many years, uh, you know, including robotics, uh, remote surgery through robots, et cetera. But the advent of uh, XR really allows to project uh, um, what we what we call like an expert surgeon into a situation that uh, you know where, where his help is needed, and you know the work that we have done actually show that the introduction of XR and the way we are doing it is we have a expert surgeon in a VR environment, uh, and we have a novice surgeon in an augmented reality environment, and a patient on an operating table, and we project the expert as an avatar, um, you know in front of them, basically recreating almost like a collocated setting, even if the expert and the novice are uh, separate in space. But this really helps uh, uh, bringing, you know, the novice up to par. Uh, so the study that we run uh, showed that, uh, you know, experts, uh, sorry, novices are able to perform those procedures at the same level as, uh, you know, or the same success level, at least, uh, that an expert would do. So I think extra in this case, uh, uh, is two things. One is one example of how can we actually implement remote uh, uh, mentoring, but also it really shows how this can, you know, can be applied on a, you know, in a broad spectrum and really help uh, patients that are in needs, uh, you know, in, in a variety of different settings. And the study that you're citing that shows that, are you, are you using, um, using a simulated patient? Are you using, what are you using to, to judge the success of the outcome? So we are in the reach right now. Uh, so we are basically working uh, in, we've been working initially in simulation, um, but then uh, the study that we deployed was actually done uh, with uh, cadavers uh, where, we have, where we brought in, uh, you know, a number of, or where we executed a number of different procedures. Uh, we look at the spectrum of complexity, you know, from some simple, um, you know, stopping bleeding kind of procedures at all the way to brain surgery. And by using like uh, very realistic scenarios uh, uh, and actual, the actual tools where surgeons are trained, uh, you know, in, in the regular training, we were able to you know, keep some kind of a ecological validity to what we do. And we were able to show, uh, you know, with quite, I think, uh, quite good um, validity that whatever the data that we have in this, you know, experimental settings with cadavers will probably shift quite well into the real world as well. Great. It, it, you know, it sounds pretty promising. What immediately comes to my mind is uh, I've operated in, in Africa and in Cambodia, and many times uh, patients have come in that I didn't feel like I had all of the qualifications. But, you know, in some ways, you know, you think from a compassionate use perspective, is it better to have someone who has some training than to have no one at all? And with that in mind, how do you, as you're moving potentially out of kind of experiments with humans, how do you think about the consent process? 
for talking to those patients about uh, giving informed consent prior to the operation. Yes, so consent, um, um, in this case, we're not talking about research consent, but really, you know, being able to, um, I don't know, go undergo a procedure where, you know, you're not just working with the person in front of you, but, uh, you know, with somebody else as well. So I think, um, although I'm not a clinician, uh, you know, I do a lot of consenting in research. And I think one of the key things, a key factor is really to explain and make sure that uh, the patient in this case is really uh, clear on what the technology is there for. Um, I think one key that is one, one key aspect that is very different in XR than than something from something like robotics uh, is that um, you know the XR technology is really is really like an aid, um, and uh, what they are cons what they would be consenting is using this technology to bring additional expertise to the table. Um, is, uh, you know, your XR device, your headset is not really operating the patient, but is facilitating um, this expertise to come to your table. So consent is, I think, in this case, about explaining the technology and the role that technology has and uh, making sure that uh, patients, in this case, understand uh, the value uh, that, that this brings to them. It's also important to explain uh, the risk as every, you know, anytime we have uh, ethical uh, concerns or discussions uh, and in this case the risks uh, are less about the risk directly to the patient but I think it's important to explain the fact that the technology like um, you know a lot of technology can fail uh, in in the middle of an operation etc so what would that mean what are the backups what happens you know if uh, let's say the link uh, pulls and there is no connection from the technology do but those ensure the patient is aware of what are uh, the backup uh, solution in case uh, you know the technology fails uh, in during the during the procedure yeah, it's really interesting to think about what the technology specific portions of the consent are because I typically think about you know consent involving informed consent involving risks benefits alternatives including the alternative of doing nothing so how do you how do you think about and, and, and this is uh, from the clinician's perspective, how do you think about informed consent for the clinicians to participate in this, both from a liability perspective and also potentially from a moral perspective? And so I think clinicians, um, um, uh, again, in research, we there are research uh, participants as well. So we consent them as research participants. In this case, uh, I, think they, uh, I think they need training more than, more than consent. First of all, they need to know you know, how to operate the technology and how it works. Uh, and then I think that we need to give them a choice. So uh, I want to use a parallel again with uh, robotic surgery and, for example, laparoscopic surgery. Um, very often the clinician uh, or the surgeon in this case is the one who decides, um, you know, what uh, technology to use. Uh, what is more appropriate in this specific case. And I think it, that's, that goes back to that. So um, in this case is the clinician, the surgeon, for example, in, in a remote location in Africa, um, the one who should decide, do we need this additional technology or not? So it's training and then choice uh, in terms of uh, their own, uh, I guess, clinical uh, judgment in terms of uh, is it safe, is it the right time, um, or the right opportunity to use the, this technology. And to be able to gauge safety, obviously, they need to be trained, they need to know what that means. Um, so I don't think that you should, uh, should be able to use a technology like that before knowing you know, what, are, what the potential risks for your operation, for your particular procedure will be. Right, you know, that's, that's really very thoughtful. You know, when I, again, putting myself in the position as a surgeon, as a clinician, um, if I were in that you know, remote uh, area of Africa and there was, for instance, a brain trauma that came in uh, that needed to have some sort of decompressive procedure, and I've really never done that. Yeah, I would definitely think about you know my liability. How do you address you know just at the most basic level level legal liability, or how do you anticipate addressing legal liability with providers who haven't really been trained in a specific procedure, but are willing to um, to take on a case under the tutelage of an expert? So I'm not a legal scholar, a legal expert. Um, so I can just attempt, you know, from my I don't know limited experience to think about it. Uh, uh, but I do think that uh, the local 
hospital, I might be wrong, there might be other people, maybe some of the clinicians here might have an answer as well. Uh, the local um, you know, facility, meaning where the patient is, uh, is the facility who has the liability. So the surgeon will be covered by whatever hospital they're working in, but the hospital will be liable uh, because they decided to, uh, uh, you know, that technology available and that technology a choice uh, for uh, for their surgeon. Um, again, it's not different than than, than others, uh, um, and I think I think it, it also comes to agreements uh, that uh, you know there might be in this you know network. Let's assume of experts that might jump in from a remote location and making sure that these are not just random experts, but again these are people similar to what you do uh, in. Uh, you know, in, in, in a local situation, they're credentialed and that they're able to do uh, these kind of operations. Um, obviously, especially if you're talking about international, but even without, within this, uh, you know, within the, this country in the United States, uh, uh, as a doctor and you, Charles, and others know that better than me, you cannot actually practice if you're not licensed in another state. Uh, so if you're in California, uh, you know, doing telemedicine or extended reality surgery and your patient is in New York, uh, you know, you cannot legally operate if you're not licensed there. So there are a number of things that I think still needs to be addressed also in these cases. Uh, and I think it comes down maybe to the definition of who is actually doing the surgery. And uh, in this case, I think it's still a local surgeon, going back to what I said before, probably liability and the legal um, you know, coverage uh, should probably be on the, on the local hospital. No, I think, I think that's absolutely, uh, it's really fascinating introducing these tools. When I think about using AI for intraoperative cl clinical decision support and technical support, it's being uh, used most commonly right now in orthopedic surgery and in some spine surgery. But it's it, when you think about um, uh, not only the liability perspective, but also the vulnerable patient, how do you protect the vulnerable patient in those settings and make sure that the patient uh, is fully informed, uh, is able to give consent, uh, and then also you know, realize the power that the, that the system has relative to the surgeon. Uh, particularly at, uh, when you think about the potential for surgical intraoperative disagreements, if there's one, if there's the AI system predicts one way of doing things and the surgeon thinks otherwise about it, how do you adjudicate those disagreements? Very interesting work, Nadir. Thank you. And if I if I can add one thought about yes. what you just said, uh, you know, a lot of my work in research is really about this idea of empowering clinician and not replacing them. So at the end of the day, I think it's about uh, technology that gives additional information. And I think we are responsible as technologists to provide the information in a way that is uh, actually usable, understandable. And when it gets to AI, although it's not the topic of today, really kind of thinking about this idea of explainable AI. So uh, we want to make sure that clinicians are able to take their decision based on this help, additional aid, but by understanding exactly what happens. So again, I think it's really the idea of, uh, I like to think about giving superpower to people, in this case, to clinicians or surgeons. But again, uh, it's also about making sure that they do understand, uh, you know, what this power entail and they are able to actually use them. And that's the technology or the technologist and the designers kind of responsibility to create tools so that they can actually be using them. No, thank you. I, I think that's a really, really excellent point. Um, Susan, I'm really interested in the work that you've been doing um, using XR to address bias, clinical bias. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure, uh, happy to. Um, so some of the work that I do in a research capacity um, allows us to simulate clinical interactions and um, you know, in a really fine-grained way to look at uh, behavior um, of a healthcare provider, let's say, interacting with a, a virtual human patient. Um, and because we can change the characteristics of the virtual human patient really in any way that we, we want to, we're able to do very controlled experiments looking at potential uh, differences in the way that patients are treated depending on characteristics um, like weight or race. Um, and, and certainly have found many sort of interesting uh, differences that you know, are of concern when we think about, um, you know, what's happening in actual clinics where we're not usually able to do these, these very controlled experiments. Um, so it's been a really valuable tool um, in that regard. So it's sort of interesting to think, you know, all of the ways that, that XR 
could um, exacerbate bias, but also a lot of the ways that we, we can use it to better understand people's biases and come up with ways to uh, sort of circumvent um, you know, biases that may creep into critical interactions. Yeah, you know, I think it's really fascinating. And I've, I've been thinking about, about it a lot since you, know, you and I met and talked a couple of weeks ago. One, uh, one potential, potential application I'm very interested in is do you think we could teach sort of optimal clinical behaviors to medical students and residents? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we're finding as the research um, is growing is that one size never fits all, right? So I think there are certainly um, approaches we could take to help um, certainly with those sort of quote unquote soft skills, right? The, the interpersonal piece, I think, um, is, is difficult and doesn't get a lot of airtime in medical school. And I think that's a really huge area of potential um, for XR um, in the future. So, you know, I think that's going to be something that is um, growing and I think that's going to be really useful. I don't think it's going to be uh, necessarily the way that every. Um, but I think um, it is definitely going to be an important tool in the toolbox um, to help people sort of practice, but then also be able to do things like take the perspective of the patient they just interacted with, you know, and sort of get a firsthand glimpse of what their own clinical behavior might look like, for example. So, um, especially introducing some of those new capabilities, um, I think, you know, has the capacity to be really powerful. No, it sounds like it. And just again, thinking about uh, privacy concerns, not in, in this case, not patient privacy concerns, but, you know, clinician privacy concerns, it, are there or will there be safeguards in place, do you think, in order to uh, protect clinical, the clinician's privacy uh, as the system, as, as the clinician interacts with the system and the system uh, records and gathers information about the clinician? Yeah, I mean, I think there probably will have to be um, safeguards in place. I don't, I don't think those are necessarily set up as of now, and I think there are a lot of people um, trying to come together and sort of figure out, um, given all of the data that one can collect, you know, especially say with a clinician using this, you know, using these um, approaches over and over, over time, um, you know, how much of the data is appropriate to collect, what is useful versus, um, you know, what do we not need, and therefore just, just represents additional risk to privacy um, so, I, you know, I certainly think that um, we're going to have to take steps towards that. It's not clear to me whether that's going to be uh, sort of tool or system specific or whether there will be sort of um, larger uh, you know, rules that we all agree on. Um, I'm kind of hoping for the latter, but uh, that's why we're having meetings like this one. Um, you know, but I think at the end of the day, everybody is going to need and some sort of privacy assurance. Um, you know, with use of these sorts of technologies. Um, of course, not necessarily for everything, but especially when there's a lot of sort of movement involved or, or long time periods of use. Um, certainly, I think we will need to um, come to terms with that. No, I, absolutely. I, I agree. Thank you for that. You know, when I think about, you know, confidentiality and privacy, what, what comes to my mind is really trust. Um, and I, I guess I want to open this up to the entire panel. How do we how do we foster trust with patients, with clinicians, as XR is introduced into clinical environments? Um, I'm happy to jump in on that one. Um, yes, thank you. I, I would say actually, yep, I would, I would say that we're actually painting XR with a really broad brush. Um, and I, I don't know that it's really possible or, or advisable to say, you know, for all of XR, how do we build trust? Um, there are probably some XR applications in medicine that um, I don't trust and I don't think anyone else should either, right? Um, so I, I, I think, you know, certainly there is the question of the new technology coming in, but I think we have to think a little bit deeper about sort of the individual applications that are being used, how they're being used, um, and, you know, really make sure that, that they are trustworthy, ask patients to trust them. Yeah, I, I think it's a really I can, point. I can add a little bit to it, maybe, when um, 
especially when I think about trust and some of my work is, is working on that. I, I think more about the, the AI part of it, um, you know, talk about, um, you know, clinical diagnostics or clinical aids uh, that are now, uh, you know, being driven by AI, et cetera. And I think one thing that is interesting is that uh, XR here can actually play a, a pivotal role to try to, role to, try to actually uh, explain, you know, these AI and build this trust because now we are not just blind in the literal way that you know something happens but we are potentially in an environment in an you know immersive environment where we can add information we can superimpose information we can explain what happens we can you know make sure that uh, the clinician that is relying maybe on this ai or would like to rely on this ai now has uh, you know ways to you know in, in an immersive way to really interact with these uh, ai models uh, to try and understand what's happening and you know this will build trust in the, in that sense. And I think uh, to the extent that you know we can in some particular I think clinical settings, this might 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 also shift to the patient where the patient can use maybe the XR technology really as a way to also understand what's going on either you know pre-operative or pre-treatment uh, or you know sometimes during and and uh, and really understand what's going on. So I think there is an opportunity here to use XR as a tool. To build more, more trust in this, you know, AI power future that that expects us in healthcare. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Almost, uh, almost using trust, you know, almost using the uh, the technology to foster trust in and of itself, um, you know, in a way that's very transparent and equitable. Uh, I think that's very. I think it's a very realistic goal. But I, I also think uh, I think Susan, you raise a really good point that we have to examine each application, you know, in and of itself. Uh, in order to to think about trust, uh, my last question to the panel um, before I open it up to uh, to everyone for questions uh, is you know thinking about participatory uh, processes. You know how do we make sure that we engage patients and families uh, in the process uh, as we are introducing these technologies or as we're even developing them? You know, is there a role for participatory processes? And both development and deployment. I can I can start there from the research point of view, being that I'm uh, not a clinician here. Uh, you know, it's really about um, designing. I think these new tools, new technology, new intervention, or specific application. I think with our stakeholders. And you know, I'm putting now my designer hat on, and you know. The core, one of the core beliefs we have in the design lab at UC San Diego is really to work, uh, you know, in in the context of human-centered design. Uh, yeah. So this is about really kind of bringing in people during uh, the design and development then of the technology, so that uh, even before the technology is actually out there, we have some buy some buy-in. And going back, I could make millions of examples, but going back to the example I, I discussed before of the surgery application, we actually spent almost a year uh, with surgeons uh, uh, in a mock operating room in, in my lab to really try to think through how do we develop this technology with them. So they were the ones sketching the first interfaces. They were the one, you know, really kind of um, Telling us researchers and designer, you know, what is needed, what is the right way to do it, etc. And we were, to some extent, the facilitator, really trying to use it. And and I think uh, I'm I'm applying that to a number of other um, aspects when we work with patients. That we work with uh, with them as well. We bring them in, and we 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 really amplify their voices so that even you know before we are using the technology, they are already part of it, uh, and you know it's like a user center, human center driven kind of development. Um, I'd like to hear the other panelists maybe about what happens when we deploy the technology because that that's that might be a little bit different uh, and but there might be opportunities there as well. Yes, please. That'd be great. Uh, and Susan. Uh, well, I'm also not a clinician. Um, I am also a researcher. And so I think my process also looks a lot like what Nadir just described. Um, sort of looking out over the ecosystem um, as one of the early complaints um, that we sort of had, you know, given this uh, this boom of development, is that there were a lot of uh, you know tools being developed without the input um, of the people who would eventually use them, the people who would experience them, um, and without sort of 
people who have walked this road before. Um, and so, you know, I think things are changing um, very much for the better um, in that regard. Uh, but I think, you know, if you don't start with your user input, then, you know, it's, it's a huge mistake. Um, so I, I certainly agree with that. Um, and then I also think, you know, being able to get get the technology out there, um, you know, to actually look at it in implementation um, and get it in front of people is the only way to really understand um, if you are, you know, giving the users what they need. I mean, I know Anne is, is far more involved in sort of the implementation. So I, you know, I can let her speak to that part. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I, I feel like you handed me a real softball on that one. I think both of those points are something that's really foundational to VA and specifically how we think about innovation um, in our office and certainly how we've approached um, the implementation of virtual reality. And it, it is that critical end user piece. Um, I think that's why we've seen such natural growth in the implementation across the entire agency is that we are asking for veterans to give us feedback. Uh, we're asking for our clinicians to give us feedback. And then we're working with companies that encourage and allow us to give the feedback um, and then make changes to their platform or to how they're thinking about e even things that include uh, business models. You know, how do we how do we pay for this? Uh, VA is a little bit unique in that, in that being a value-based care system, we're both the payer and the provider. Um, so we have a lot of opportunity there to go first um, and develop and evaluate those business models and then help inform what that looks like going forward for reimbursement and pieces like that. But certainly um, being able to give feedback as the provider, um, as clinicians, and then as the patients is foundational because what, what we've seen with some of the companies that have just gone like gangbusters and done, done really incredible things in the tech space and the gaming world, it's very different um, to scale this type of technology and platforms across a healthcare system. What we want, you know, what we're looking for, what we value may be very different. So I think keeping that open communication, the collaboration across government um, and industry and, and academia as well to engage some of the research piece um, that's happening there is really critical to this continuing to grow. Yeah. I, I, I certainly I appreciate that. I just want to I just want to say that you know I think you know all of the stuff that is going on in this area is so important but I, I think I want to push us a little bit because probably what we're doing for the most part and you know maybe not everywhere but I think we're, we're reaching the people who are already you know interested the people who are most likely to come to the table um, and so we probably do need to do some more research and some more formative work to better understand those who are a little bit more hesitant you know, about putting a headset on or about, um, you know, thinking about using some of the technology, because I'm not sure at this stage, we've really reached back to the people. Um, and, you know, whether they'll benefit differentially or not, I don't think we know. And I think this goes back to equity and some of the things that we said before. So it's really about bringing equity back to the table, even when we design the technology. And I think, again, being Either we are kind of at the beginning of the introduction of XR into healthcare. I think, again, we can hopefully use the, the opportunity that this new technology gives us to really making it equitable. So I 100% I, I agree with that. Uh, I don't think it's an easy thing to do, but I think it's a thing that we need really to, uh, to put a lot of effort on. Yeah, I can't agree more. I think it's so important that we have a diverse group of users. Uh, and we also use that to build trust. I think there's a lot of opportunity, you know, as Nadir said earlier, to use the technology to actually build trust in communities. So uh, I hope that, you know, as we deploy these systems and as we you know, continue to develop them, we think very much about diversity, not just in our training sets, but also diversity in our users. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, if you want to use the raise your hand feature, uh, I've got the uh, host uh, panel up, I could call on participants um, uh, and give the audience a chance to ask questions. Well, while our audience is thinking of questions, uh, I want to ask one more, uh, and that is, you know, we've talked a little bit about talk a lot about the benefits a little bit about uh some of the uh, potential harms 
What are the fears? What are the fears? I mean, uh, the three of you are very much on the forefront uh, here uh, of this technology. What are some of the fears that you have uh, as the technology is deployed and introduced? I think my, my biggest fear is that uh, it all becomes, uh, you know, um, it go, everything goes along the line of what's happening with the initial, at least, plans for the metaverse. Uh, uh, and, you know, what, um, you know, we're seeing in terms of everything that goes online, uh, you know, it focuses a lot on exploita exploitation, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my biggest fear is that we're fall, we really fall into that trap, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in a variety of settings, healthcare as well, but obviously not just healthcare. One of the risks is that XR technology will be used across the spectrum. So I totally see you know, the same person using a headset for gaming and then using the same headset for their visit with their clinicians. So how do we make sure that we shield healthcare for sure, but also the rest of the uh, spectrum from, from these, you know, profits and ad-based kind of, you know, models that, that we're seeing that are, that are probably in the plans for some of the biggest metaverse or biggest, you know, XR actors in the future. Great, thank you. We, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Cybergar. Hey, Charles, uh, and hey, everyone. Amplify my voice. Um, and I've been asking this question to everyone all day today, and mainly because I want to understand from experts um, whose responsibility you think it is. And I, in the previous uh, conversations when we were talking about Roe versus Wade, I, I wanted to specifically describe as you are the leaders in space, um, how can we potentially be more prescriptive? Say, yes, it's shared responsibility, but uh, at XRSI, we're working on some kind of a shared responsibility model. I wonder if you could just call out some of the top key stakeholders that we must not forget about who should potentially even be held accountable and then, you know, what kind of a direction should we be looking at? And that potentially comes to my mind is, you know, looking at enabling data sharing rather than like, hey, don't share the data because the other one. So I'm just wondering within the hospital network, within the research setting, uh, within this sort of a larger collective XR or metaverse ecosystem, if you could call out each one of you maybe like potential top three stakeholders whose responsibility it is to confront these ethical challenges that include privacy. I can, um, I can start on that for sure. I think uh, the people that come to the mind are the very people that we have these conversations with almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So for us, our Office of Information Technology um, the group of people who really are at the center of any sort of IT integration across our entire um, healthcare system. We also have um, Office of Privacy um, and Information Security. So I think those uh, those people, while they originally initially haven't known a ton about virtual reality and certainly the use in, in healthcare, we've helped them learn about that as an opportunity and modality. They've helped us learn about um, certainly the 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 use of vr in general and privacy um cautions we might even known existed i think also the patient um we we need to know what it looks like from the patient's perspective to protect uh, their data and their information as well so I, I can jump in there and I, I you know i totally agree with ann you know in terms of sort of the the, the hospital focused healthcare focused experience um i think sort of Picking off of something Adir was saying earlier, uh, there is danger that that we will go the direction of the technologies before us. Um, and in terms of the sort of wellness side of things, um, you know, that's the wild west, if you will. Um, and so the question there, you know, I think probably certainly the companies, although I don't know that we can necessarily count on all of them, um, but you know, I also don't think we need the onus should be on the uh, the user either. So certainly, you know, legislation is a great tool um, to protect, uh, you know, the consumer in that case, I suppose. Um, 
but you know it's interesting you know Kavya, you sort of talked about data and data sharing and and you know we we live in a world of, of data silos in a lot of cases especially in healthcare um and you know with the metaverse the idea is that we're going to move away from that um and i i think it's going to be really important um for people like us and the people who make our our um policies and, and rules to think about you know how we can preserve the unique um benefits of the data that we get from from XR um, that we can put that towards our healthcare and put that towards the uses we we want to use it for but then also prevent others from using it in ways that we wouldn't, wouldn't want it to be so <laughs> I don't want to create more silos you know in a world that's trying to sort of bring everything together um, but I, I do really think that um, healthcare certainly and maybe even you know reaching into wellness we may need to think about um, sort of special roles so i want to add one one thing um about the special i think case of healthcare um which i think could be a good a, an advantage to you know thinking about how to how we could lead in this sense is healthcare is typically has two aspects that i think are, are important one is it's a much more of a value-based um uh, space to to navigate. Yes, there are companies, and yes, there is there are people that want to make profit. A lot of people go into healthcare because they want to help. They want to help patients. They want to help people, etc. So I think a lot of the people working in the space can you know really kind of try to use that value based approach to really think through you know what are our values uh, in in this case. Uh, the second one is also that we do have mechanisms that other uh, in other in, you know environments. We don't, and sometimes if we we refer to them, you know, in a neg in a negative way, but I think it could actually help here. Uh, I'm thinking uh, things like the, in the U.S. the the HIPAA law that is you know protecting uh, you know patients and confidentiality and privacy. So how do we implement it, and how do we make sure that uh, you know we implement it right in, in uh, you know in XR? I'm also thinking about the FDA, for example, for medical devices, etc. Uh, very often is seen as a hurdle, but on the other side, it, it actually adds a level of uh, regulation. Uh, sometimes it's too much regulation, which is then, you know, a problem for innovation. But on the other side, these are mechanisms that if you use them in the right way, maybe we have to rethink them a little bit, uh, but can help, uh, uh, you know, facilitate uh, some more, I don't know, careful uh, introduction of the technology and, and, and protecting, you know, the individuals that are working with that. Yeah, you know, again, coming about the patient centric perspective, I think about protection of the vulnerable patient and particularly um, across platforms. I guess this is what I worry a little bit about is the potential of, of one prediction to bias another prediction in a way that would limit a patient's autonomy. Uh, for instance, you know, a predictive modeling that suggests that somebody has six months or less to live. How is that going to bias other clinical decisions? And then would that become a self-fulfilling prophecy, for instance? And what if it's a reversible condition, but everyone takes that, the clinicians see that is simply a futility marker. So while, while I do think we need to break down the silos, I think we have to be cautious about protecting the information, uh, particularly as the information um, could, could bias, could affect other clinical decisions in such a way as to um, to limit the patient's autonomy and to limit the options that are given to the patient, particularly if payers start embedding their own platforms into the electronic medical record. I mean, I, I certainly um, I am so grateful for the work the VA does and that Anne specifically does. Um, it, it is they, the VA has always been a very innovative place uh, for health, particularly in systems uh, from a systems perspective. Uh, but but it's a, also, as she uh, is uh, Anne acknowledged, it's a system that you have payer and provider aligned, and that's not true uh, in most places in healthcare. That the the that um, there are going to be instances in which a prediction that a patient has less than six months to live will very much affect how a payer is going to view that patient. Any other questions or comments? Any any uh, final messages that our panelists want to leave the audience with? And uh, Dr. Charles, there is one quick question from online from Divya. 
Uh, and I wonder if that was communicated to you directly. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Uh, do you find privacy and security on edge devices for these patients limits your research and ability to aggregate and share? So for me, you know, I'll say that that's um, not a context that I, I tend to work in. Um, you know, we tend to directly uh, collect our data, but I think it is uh, it's a good example of you know these these questions of where do you draw the lines for access, um, and are there ways to you know draw them such that they can be used for good when a user or a participant you know consents to that. Um, you know, can we have a different pipeline that allows use um, of the data uh, for, for certain other, um, you know, other uses that, that push everything forward? I can add to it, and, you know, I, I, I agree with that. And uh, I think it's really about this idea of uh, an opt-in versus an opt-out kind of uh, um, paradigm that, you know, edge devices or edge data on the edge allows us to do the control is in the user hands and yes it does uh, obviously make it more difficult to share the data but i think it's a cost uh, that we we should think about we can invest in ways and technology and, and and you know different kind of strategies to make this data more shareable uh you know in ways that still protect privacy but you know making sure that first and foremost we do protect the privacy and then we think about how do we share it in a way that is, you know, uh, considering the privacy of the individuals. Yeah, I, I think it's really important here to think about the patient as patient, uh, the patient also as a potential donor, and the patient also as a learning subject. There's sort of these three roles that the patient plays in this environment. And in general, uh, in confidentiality has been one of the mainstays of, of medicine. It's part of the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and so to think about, you know, privacy as a function of confidentiality and how that pertains to building trust and to fostering the relationship. I mean, I, you know, and, and my concern is not that, you know, patients' private data will appear in the New York Times, but rather that, um, that it will, again, bias other predictions through the platform. That privacy really has to do with giving the patient the ability to decide how their data is going to be used. Uh, how, uh, is another question. How have you created an infrastructure to consent patients? What does your IRB look like? Maybe so I can talk quickly to, to our IRB. I think a lot of the IRB are, are similar, but uh, you know, every study obviously needs to be approved by an IRB. Um, and uh, you know, we have um, uh, two IRBs at UC San Diego. We have uh, what we call a social and behavioral science IRB, and we have a medical IRB. And uh, the committees review everything you do. But one thing that uh, you know is really interesting, and that's a shift in the last ten years, uh, or in the last couple of years over the the ten years I've been or the twelve years I've been at UCSD, is that IRB is working much more with the researchers, uh, you know, to really understand the role of the technology. I remember ten years ago it was really difficult to get anything that was collecting any data, uh, you know, to be approved as a device to use, especially in healthcare. Uh, it was a blanket no you cannot do it and understandably why uh, while today there is more of a conversation and really kind of a way to try and understand obviously benefits and risks but also uh, you know really kind of working with the researcher to find uh, ways that we can um, protect uh, patients and participants uh, um, but on the other side uh, enable innovation and, and new technologies to be integrated uh, and do you want to address that specifically from the perspective of the VA? From the, can, the IRB consent perspective? Right. The question about the IRB yeah. and, and yeah, infrastructure so, consent. Certainly. So um, what we're doing with clinical implementation, because it's not formal in, uh, research, we are documenting uh, consent in the chart, uh, patient consent, where we do, um, we certainly have funded 
formal research studies with IRB. I don't have visibility on those, uh, but VR is treated very similarly to other um, reviewed studies. So um, I wouldn't expect this to be any different. Right, so it's more of a patient consent than it is a patient as study subject consent. Correct, correct. That's certainly how it's done in um, the clinical implementation piece. Um, and I would imagine the same for our more for formal research processes, but I don't, like I said, I, I, I don't have visibility into those individual funded research projects, um, their IRB processes. Right, right. Thank you. So I think we have about a minute left. Any uh, closing thoughts? Anyone uh, want to uh, leave the uh, audience with uh, any parting thoughts? I can share one, and I kind of already talked to it, uh, uh, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I think healthcare is a special um, environment, it's a special setting uh, where we have uh, the, and we have the opportunity to really kind of lead the way in the way that we use the technology and, the, you know, the XR technology. Um, I think we just want, we really want to try to set an example in terms of uh, protection, privacy, safety, uh, you know, for our participants being in the research or in the clinic and hopefully the rest of the world will follow. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I mean, if, if anyone can do it, we can do it. We have our systems set up. We understand these issues. Um, so I totally agree um, that we, we should be leading the way on this. Well, I must say I'm grateful that this is the group leading the way. It's a, I'm a very impressed um, by uh, both your insight uh, and also uh, very much your prioritization of patients uh, as you build these systems and as you deploy them. So thank you all very much. It's been a real pr privilege to be here and to get to know all of you. Thank you, Charles.